All right, this is the fight block. My name is Jeremy here once again with Coop. Uh, what we got on schedule for today's episode? We've got UFC 153 this Saturday main event. Stefan Bonner stepping up on short notice, taking on Anderson Silva, who's also stepping up on short notice, pretty much to to save the card. This takes place in Brazil, so it'll be in Anderson Silva's backyard. I mean, for for having your co-main event and main event canceled in the same day, I think they did a decent job recovering and saving this card. So uh, there's some fun fights, and uh, so we're going to drop our predictions first for that, and then we're going to do a, a second segment here uh, and give our UFC on FX recap, um, some pretty decent fights, and uh, also kind of a bizarre happening on the Ariel Hawani's MMA Hour podcast, internet show, uh, had a guest appearance from Mayhem Miller, um, but Mayhem Miller didn't show up. It was his his character from his upcoming movie, Here Comes the Boom, Lucky Patrick, who showed up instead of Mayhem, and uh, which meaning Mayhem was in character but refused to speak to Ariel as Mayhem. It was a very bizarre uh, interview, and it, it appeared as though Mayhem wasn't fully there and that there might have been a little bit more to this than you know just Mayhem. Uh, playing a character uh, he has had a kind of a, a, a troubled couple months and uh, a lot of people are kind of concerned about him and you know he's supposed to come on the show to kind of answer some questions uh, regarding what's happened and he, he he didn't he ended up walking off the show so we're gonna just give a quick uh, uh, our, our thoughts on that on mayhem and and the interview so with that being said uh, Let's get started with our uh, with our predictions. I guess there's uh, from what I'm seeing online here, we got six fights on the main card. Coop, you want to introduce the first fight? So uh, starting for the card from the bottom up, we got Damian Maya, former middleweight, dropping down to the 170 pound division, uh, taking on Rick Horror Story. Uh, Damian Maya's debut is against Dong, Dong the Dongster, aka the Stun Gun Kim. Um, he actually had kind of a freak injury, and so that won Damian Maya the fight. That actually was a fight that I was looking forward to because it was going to be, you know, like a judo style grappler against a jiu jitsu player. Looked to be exciting. Um, so, it's a shame we didn't get to see that fight in its full um, play out. Yeah, but, re- really didn't get to see much of that fight at all. I mean, if I remember correctly, correctly, the injury happened pretty early on in the fight before really anything happened. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was more on paper going to be a good fight. Um, and then now we got a good fight, too. Can't complain about this one either. Damian Maya taking on Rick Horror Story. Um, this could be potentially fight of the night. Um, I think that this one is going to be a actually fairly easy win, maybe submission of the night uh, for Damian Maya. I mean, I could see it being fight of the night for sure, but I just see Rick's story playing into his game. You know, Rick's game's kind of about closing the distance. A lot of it's clinch work anyways. Um, I see Damian Maya scoring a trip out of that. Um, if Rick wants to stand and bang, Damian Maya's the bigger, longer guy, and Rick's stand-up's kind of rudimentary anyways. Um, so I could see him, you know, needing to close the distance, being a shorter guy, only to have Damian clinch and then trip and take him down. Or I could see Rick trying to ground and pound, and Damian Maya submitting him from his open guard. I mean, every way I look at this, it just looks like a submission loss for Rick's story. I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one. Um, Damian Maya... We haven't really, I mean, haven't seen him really use his submission game and who knows how many fights. It's been a while. Um, he's really gone uh, by way of decision in a lot of his fights, gone to the judges uh, recently. He has been working on his stand-up game, and although it has improved, it's still not great. And uh, Rick Story, he had a lot of momentum, uh, close to getting a title shot, but then lost the... Uh, that fight to Charlie Brenneman, who stepped in on short notice and pretty much shocked everyone by beating Story. Uh, Story then went on to lose to Martin Campman, who, you know, top contender right there in the mix for a title shot. And uh, But he bounced back, and he's coming off a win over Brock Jardine. But, you know, uh, Story, very much a decision fighter himself, too. He's got a wrestling background, and, uh, you know, he, it seems as though in his last couple fights, too, that uh, he's tend to, to gas towards the 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 end of the later rounds, but uh, but yeah, I'm I'm picking story in this fight. I think it's going to be for the most part a stand up uh, fight, and I haven't really seen 
you know, Maya uses submission game. Uh, a lot of his fights haven't been going to the ground. So I see Story, you know, utilizing his wrestling to keep this fight standing. Uh, he might push uh, Maya up against the cage, you know, avoid any sort of standing guillotines or anything up against the cage like that. But I, I think both these guys are going to stand a trade, and I'm going to give a, a striking advantage to Story. I think he could put on the pressure uh, on Maya, back Maya up against the cage, and uh, and tee off on him, score some points. So I'm taking uh, Story to beat Maya by decision in this fight. Very interesting. Um, I see where you're coming from, though, so I don't think it's worth... It's not making me... Let's put it this way. It's not making me go ba- back here and scratch my head. But um, I just see that... You know, Damian Maia was viewed as a top contender at 185 at one time, um, and that was when he was using his ground game more. Uh, we did see, I believe the injury was after he tried to do some ground work on Don- the Donkster. Um, and I just see... Well, actually, I think it was Dung Young Kim that got hurt in that fight. Yeah, that oh. it was. That's you know, yeah, I think he took him down and took his back or something like that, or had a body triangle, something like that, something weird. Um but I think that Damian Maia is kind of a new man at 170. I think he fell in love with his striking while he was kind of improving it a lot. Um, but I think he's at a point now where if he was in a position to submit somebody, he's not going to back off that just to play kind of a sloppy striking match. Whereas when he was kind of falling in love with training his Muay Thai more, we saw him try to utilize it and get more cage time with it, especially against opponents he could get away with it against like Dan Miller. Um, but I just, I don't think Rick Story is that smart of a fighter. If you go back and you look at his fights like against Tiago Alves, which is probably his biggest win, you know, the way he fought was a little bit, I mean, it was more the way Tiago lost. If you look at that fight, Story was able to cut him off against the cage, and that's mainly how he won, and he did that because Tiago wasn't really using angles. If you look at Chuck Liddell's fights, when he kind of throws his hook, if a guy, a wrestler, or somebody's charging him, he kind of like sidesteps him almost like a bullfighter and then hits him from this new angle. And it also made it so that guys couldn't clinch him against the cage. You know, Chuck Liddell wasn't very often pinned up against the cage, although I'm sure a lot of guys would have wanted to do that because he wouldn't have been able to really tee off on them if you eliminated his range. Um, basically, Tiago didn't do that. He stood still, just tried to wing hooks. That's kind of what lost him the fight. Um, and Martin Campman, again, It was the, the skill differential was pretty clear. There's also a little bit of a reach thing going on, which will be kind of similar with Maya. Maya is a pretty tall guy, especially for 170. Um, other, other than that, I mean, Rick Story's other biggest win is against Johnny Hendricks, um, which, you know, was a decision and stands as Hendricks' really only loss. Um, that's pretty impressive, but... It just seems like Rick's either a really horrible matchup for all, all the guys that he does beat. And then other than that, I mean, it's pretty – it isn't impossible to beat uh, Rick Story, put it that way. You know, John Hathaway's done it, and, you know, he could be a future contender, so I don't really want to put that down. Um, his other big wins against Jake Ellenberger, although that was really early in Jake Ellenberger's career. Yeah, no, I, I'll give you that, you know. He's not the most crisp of fighters. Like I said, um, just off his last couple of fights, he has sort of gas towards the later rounds. And, you know, if he plays into to his wrestling game and tries to grapple with uh, Maya, you could definitely get caught. But, uh, but yeah, so you've got Maya by submission. I've taken story by decision. But we're going to move on to the, the next fight. It's uh, Wagner Prado against Phil Davis. It's a, I guess you could call it the rematch or the rescheduled fight. Uh, they originally uh, were scheduled on the UFC on Fox Shogun vs. Vera card back in uh, August. And uh, Phil Davis accidentally poked Wagner in the eye. And, uh, you know, he was willing to still fight. It was kind of a, an interesting call. He said he was good to go. And then all of a sudden, actually, you know, they're calling the fight off. The doctor called it off or the referee called it off. One of the two, or they talked together and they called the fight. And, uh, you know, Wagner was really upset. It was his UFC debut at the time. And uh, so, yeah, now they're, they've rescheduled the fight. It's happening again. And, uh, yeah, Wagner, I mean, this is, you know, once again, you know, it's, I guess it's officially a, his debut follow up, but um, he hasn't had a f- complete fight yet. But he is known for uh, some heavy hands. He's a Brazilian fighter, so he's going to be fighting in his. Uh, home country, so crowd's gonna be on his side, and yeah, I mean a lot of his fights are you know by knockout, TKO, but Phil Davis is definitely top competition that he's ever faced. You know he's got the wrestling background, and 
I see Phil Davis winning this fight, and uh, Davis's uh, striking definitely uh, could use improvement. We saw that in his fight with Rashad Evans, but he's got that wrestling background that really is going to enable him to, to to control this fight. And you know, if he's at any danger with uh, Wagner on the feet, I can see him just taking this fight to the ground. Uh, and working his way to a decision, which I see this fight going to, another decision. I'm taking Phil Davis to win by UD. Yeah, um, I mean, it's kind of hard to go from, I mean, it's it's really hard to pick a guy who you look at his record, and it's a bunch of names nobody's ever heard of, and then his leap goes from names that don't even have a listing on most Wikipedia or fight pages to... Phil Davis, it's, I mean, it's kind of out of the realm of possibility to at least look at him as the favorite. Obviously, that anybody has a chance in any fight, technically. Um, and he may have a brighter career, we just don't know, you know. He didn't really have a full fight, so he may still have some UFC jitters, too. Um, but he is fighting Phil Davis, who is, you know, in the top 10 at light heavyweight and a very tough draw, especially as your first fight. Um the way I see this fight going is similar to how Phil Davis, like when he's winning, usually looks. I mean, it's just pretty much take him down, get him into weird positions, and then kind of force a submission on him, usually from top control. Um, I think that's what he's going to do to uh, Wagner Prado. Um, I see Prado as a blue belt, which, so you know, he has some jujitsu skills, but I know I just, Phil Davis is pretty creative with his submissions, and he's really good at getting people in the positions to execute them. Um, in addition to that, I, I see Prado's trying to keep it in a stand-up game and uh, basically keep the fight on his feet. And I just think Phil Davis's wrestling is going to be the best wrestling Prado's ever faced. And Phil's not going to have a problem taking him down. Um, I actually see Phil submitting him within the first two rounds. Alrighty. So then moving on to the fight I'm actually most looking forward to. I think this is an awesome matchup. Uh, up and coming prospect, Eric Silva, uh, takes on John Fitch, definitely the uh, the best competition Silva's seen inside the octagon. John Fitch coming off uh, his first knockout loss in the in the UFC. That was a uh, first round, I believe, first round knockout to uh, Johnny Hendricks. So that was a, a big surprise, big win for Hendricks there. So Fitch is bouncing off that loss. Um, and Eric Silva, since coming to the UFC, is, he has one loss on uh, uh, under his belt, but it's a DQ and it's kind of a, a controversial call. Uh, he was disqualified for a punch to the back of the head when, uh, you know, one one punch looked like it kind of grazed the back of the head and the rest, I mean, the, his opponent was done. And, uh, but yeah, the ref called it off, called it a DQ. It was pretty controversial. So he should be undefeated, but uh, this is his uh, fourth time inside the cage. He's three and one and uh, he's just looked really impressive. Uh, he's, he, his last win was a submission victory over Charles Brenneman. Um, and then he had the DQ loss to Carlo Prater, but he also won his first two fights by submission and knockout. So, um, actually, let's see. No, his debut was knockout. He's only been in the octagon three times. So three, he's three and one, uh, or two and one. I've got it all mixed up. Anyways, he's an upcoming prospect. And, uh, I, I just, I'm looking forward to this fight. But, you know, he is, John Fitch is definitely the, the toughest competition Silva's seen. You know, I want to pick Silva in this fight just because, you know, I've, I've really liked what I've seen from him. But, you know, Fitch is tough to beat. And he, he got caught against Hendricks. And uh, we have all seen how tough of a chin Fitch has had in his career. And, you know, that knockout loss was really surprising. And I don't think it's really one of those punches that's really going to affect him for the rest of his career. I think he's going to bounce back. And uh, I think he grabs a hold of Silva, pushes him up against the cage, and just, you know, works his John Fitch style. Maybe not the most exciting, but I, I see Fitch. Man, am I picking another decision here? I need to start mixing this up. But I'm, I'm taking John Fitch to win this by uh, by decision. I, I think he gets a hold of Silva, uh, gets Silva to the ground, and uh, just kind of holds him there or against the cage. But uh, this is a great matchup, and I originally wanted to pick Silva to win by TKO, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he does. And uh, but I, I got to go with Fitch on this one. And uh, Fitch is definitely the, the toughest competition Silva's seen yet. So it'll be a good test. 
Yeah, I think, you know, you look at uh, Silva and then all you can really think about is potential. The guy is quite possibly the future at 170, but that's just it. He's the future. John Fitch, simple as that. He's he's the present. I don't know how if John Fitch will ever get another title shot um, or if he'll ever be a champion. Um, but he already has a career he can hang his hat on. I mean, you look at you look at Silva's wins and the biggest on there is Charlie Brenneman. And then you go and you take a look at John Fitch's record, and the names that pop up on there are guys like Shoney Carter, Tiago Alves twice, he's faced and beat Diego Sanchez, Paulo Tiago, Mike Pierce, Ben Saunders. I mean, the guys faced and beaten top competition, a lot of those names are, if not all of them, are more accomplished than Eric Silva is at this point. Um, the only way to logically pick this fight with Silva winning is based on John Fitch's last fight, which is a knockout loss, which means you basically assume that John Fitch's chin is gone already, which it's kind of dumb to assume that because he, he just kind of got caught. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that his chin has deteriorated in any of his other fights. And I mean, you know, in his last two fights before that, he fought BJ Penn, Tiago Alves, who both have pretty heavy hands. Um, I mean, in addition to that too, it's it just seems like one of those fights that is favors Fitch anyways. You know he's going to be the bigger guy. He's facing an opponent that probably hasn't faced as good of a wrestler as Fitch is. Um, on top of that too, you know Fitch was injured or, or sick when he was actually taking that fight. He just kind of need it was in a situation where he needed the money at the time. Um, say what you will about guys making mistakes, but for every guy like Brandon Vera who makes a million mistakes or excuse me, who makes a million excuses um, about his mistakes. I mean, you have a guy who has like an, an honest, legitimate kind of shortcoming. I mean, when else has Fitch made a mistake? You know, after the George St. Pierre fight, his most notable loss, he made zero excuses. He's like, I need to get back in there, work harder and get, you know, back to the drawing board. So if Fitch says he has an injury, I believe him. He's also always pretty honest about his style too. You know, he isn't in there to just stand and bang and get fight of the night and I when you look at Fitch fight it looks like he is trying to finish it just looks like he is a shitty finisher you know he, he doesn't just sit on him he's always trying to work for better position um, most of the time so I actually like John Fitch even if I don't necessarily always like watching his fights um, a lot of the time too I think he gets a worse rap than he deserves because if he's against an opponent that kind of is good at defending against his sort of you know clinch and wrestling game like BJ Penn he can have an exciting fight um, but if he gets a guy who has really poor takedown defense, like, you know, Tiago Alves or Ben Saunders, then we're just kind of in for a one-sided fight, which, you know, it's equally on his opponent to, uh, to blame for that. So basically John Fitch decision, I think it's going to be 30, 27. Alrighty. We agree. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Should be a good one. Interesting matchup, but, uh, moving on to one of the, uh, the bouts that has been, res uh, scheduled, uh, I guess this guy can be considered a prospect. I mean, it's been a long time coming for him uh, to finally make it into the UFC. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, a little bit older, but uh, but definitely he's got the skill sets to make a name in the the division. That's Glover T uh, Teixeira taking on Fabio Maldonado, who's stepping in for Quentin Rampage Jackson, who uh, had to step out of the fight uh, with an injury. But uh, Fabio Maldonado stepped up right away and said, give me this fight, I want it. Uh, both guys are from Brazil, and uh, it's the only Brazilian versus Brazilian matchup on the main card. But, you know, Glover Teixeira, dangerous striker. You know, he's got a submission uh, game also. Uh, won his UFC debut by submission, defeating Kyle Kingsbury. Uh, Fabio Maldonado actually has a decision loss to Kyle Kingsbury. Maldonado coming off of back-to-back -back losses. Kind of a, you know, interesting fight to, to step up on short notice and say, I want this fight because, you know, Teixeira uh, is no joke. And uh, it's a, definitely a step up competition, a step up in competition from uh, Maldonado's last two fights. If Maldonado loses, that's three in a row. But, you know, Dana White likes those guys that step up and say, give me, give me a fight. So, you know, win or lose, he, he could still be in the UFC. Maldonado definitely uh, can hold his own on the feet, which is where I see most of this fight taking. Should be a, a nice striking battle. And, uh, you know, Glover Teixeira has some sick boxing. And uh, he's got some power to go with it. And Maldonado, I don't believe, has ever been finished in his career um, by knockout. Uh, 
yeah, he's got two uh, submission losses, a decision, and three decision losses. So you know, he can he can take a, a beating himself. So you know, I can't pick another decision, but I I'm going with Teixeira to win this one. Uh, he's looking to make a name for himself. I know he's been training. He's moved out, um, I believe, to California. He's been training with Chuck Liddell, and uh, Chuck Liddell was really kind of taking him under his wing, and uh, and so he's been uh, active over there in San Luis Obispo with with uh, with Chuck, and you know Chuck sees big things from this guy, and you know a couple couple wins, and he could be right there in the mix for uh, contention. So. I'm taking Glover to share to win this one. I say he wins it by TKO. I think it'll be first loss for Maldonado. Uh, Maldonado seems to, to gas kind of a little bit as the fight goes on, especially if he's taking a beating. So I, I see Teixeira put on the pressure and uh, and catching Maldonado and finishing this fight. I'll say in the the second round. Yeah, I think uh, when you look at this fight, I mean honestly, I think both guy both guys striking's a little bit overrated to be honest, especially Maldonado's. Um, but even Teixeira's, you know, look at his fights, go watch any of them. It basically consists of him throwing the cross counter, um, walking up to his opponent, waiting for them to kind of strike first, throws the right cross counter. And then what he does is he brings a left hook in there to kind of bring his head back to the center of the uh, center of things to kind of avoid any sort of power shots of his opponent. And he kind of just, for the most part, tries that over and over again. And it usually works for him because it's not a super common technique, um, at least in MMA yet. Uh, to be doing repeatedly. It's also kind of hard to time. In addition to that, though, Teixeira, he's one of the biggest names to make a debut in the light heavyweight division in a while because he's had visa issues which have delayed it. Um, he's actually trained with Chuck Liddell for a while um, on and off at the pit. I know he's had to stay in Brazil for a while, too. Um, other you know, great guy to have on your side, UFC legend Pedro Hizo, who was in his corner in his last fight. You know, John Hackleman's always a great guy to have on your side, too. I mean, Teixeira's pretty battle-tested. We'll see how he performs on the main stage, but, you know, there's a reason the leap in his competition went from Kyle Kingsbury all the way to Rampage Jackson. It's because there's some pretty high hopes pinned on this guy um, already. I mean, he has some other good wins, too. Matt Horwich, Soka Jew, Joaquim Ferreira. Um, I mean, he's faced other guys that are somewhat notables, like Marcio Pedepano Cruz, Marvin Eastman, Rico Rodriguez. Um you can kind of throw in uh, Shogun's name in there too, with uh, the rumored bout of uh, Teixeira against Shogun, and you know Teixeira being offered to Shogun as an opponent, but Shogun turning down Teixeira because he wasn't, you know, a name opponent yet. And granted, yeah, he was, you know, Teixeira was trying to, you know, make his way into the UFC, and Shogun didn't want to make the, have this guy beat him and make a name off of him. But that also shows, you know, Shogun showing this guy a little bit of respect coming into the UFC too. Yeah, I don't think Shogun thinks that he would lose to him. It's one of those situations where Shogun's knees are like, I mean, Shogun's like the oldest 30-year-old I've ever seen. Is He's 30, but his knees, I mean, his chin's still great. One of the best chins, actually, but his knees, you know, look like that of a 70-year-old. So he kind of has to pick and choose his, you know, remaining fights. And I think he's earned the right to do that, especially when, you, you know, all the merits that Shogun has and, you know, just being a gamer no matter what, probably taking more punishment than a lot of other fighters, all his fights for the fans, never see a boring Shogun fight. You know, he takes fights on short notice when his knees are blown out and he shouldn't, like his title fight against John Jones. But, I mean, I don't disrespect Shogun for that, but I, it's, I agree it's a nod of respect. Like, okay, this I want to wait till this guy beats a notable name or two before I fight him. Um that way I have something to gain from it too and not just him. Because if Shogun beats Teixeira, then everybody just says, oh, well, Teixeira wasn't as good as we thought he was. And Shogun doesn't really earn anything from it at this point. Um, this fight I see going horribly for Fabio Maldonado. Um, I think he's a game opponent. I think he's a tough guy. But I actually think Teixeira is going to knock him out in the first round. Possibly knock out of the night. All righty. We both expect big things from uh, from. Teixeira, as well as a lot of people. So we'll see if uh, Teixeira can live up to that hype. But uh, moving on to the co-main event, uh, this is another fight that was added just to kind of make up for the lost fights. But uh, Antonio uh, Rodrigo Noguera uh, steps up, heavyweight division to take on Dave Pee Wee Herman. Noguera coming off of that brutal uh, submission loss to Frank Mir. Frank Mir snapped his arm. Surprisingly, didn't need surgery. Uh, I saw the X-rays and it looked pretty brutal. His, you know, his bone right by his bicep was like snapped. 
So I guess that healed without having any type of surgery at all. But uh, <laughs> Nogueira, I guess I'm not surprised with Nogueira coming from a guy that got run over by a truck and survived. Yeah, I still have a, I'm a conspiracy theorist a little bit. I, I think Nogueira is actually a zombie. I'm just going to throw that out there. There you go. I, I would believe it, you know. And uh, October, quite a good month for uh, for zombies. Yeah, so the Brazilian zombie. We have a Korean zombie. Why not a Brazilian zombie, you know? Minotauro, nah, that's old. Let's let's go with the Brazilian zombie, Antonio Nogueira. <laughs> I think it's a good fit. So he takes on Dave Herman. Herman was a, a, a nice pickup by the UFC. You know, had a lot of... Uh, Momentum going behind him when uh, when he came up, he's you know got knockout power and just all around a, a good a fun fighter to watch. He's a, he's a brawler for the most part, and uh, he had a pretty good chin, but he's lost his last two fights by uh, knockout to Roy Nelson and TKO by to Stefan Struve. So he's com- coming off a two fight losing streak. Um, I think this is a a, a good matchup, and uh, you know these guys are going to stand and trade and. Nogueira, you know, he, he looks like he's in his 40s, like he's an old man, but uh, he's actually only 36. So, uh, you know, he, he's definitely been in some wars, and I think that's what's kind of added on the extra ages or so it appears. But uh, but I don't know. I mean, th- this fight, you, you would think, you know, the more agile sort of uh, younger appearing fighter and Dave Herman would have an edge just maybe with his quickness and and uh, and style and speed and but you know I, that's what I was thinking in the Brendan Schaub fight when Schaub fought Nogueira I thought you know <laughs> Nogueira didn't stand a chance just because you know Schaub was the young up-and-coming prospect heavy hands uh, quick but you know Nogueira held his own he ended up knocking out Brendan Schaub I will say though I think Herman's chin is about 10 times better than Schaub's true true which is why I'm not picking Nogueira to win by knockout, but by submission. And, uh, you know, submission is what Nogueira has in the back of his mind the entire fight, I think. I think that's how he comes into fight and he wants to win. We saw that in his fight with Frank Mir, uh, his last fight. You know, had Mir rocked, Mir fell back, you know. All he had to do was land a couple more punches and the ref was going to be right there to step in, but... You know, Nogueira chose to slap on that guillotine and finish the fight by submission. And next thing you know, Mir, there was just enough for Mir to reverse and catch uh, Nogueira in the arm bar or, no, the Kimura or whatever it was, the American. Kimura. Yeah, and snapped his arm. So, but I mean, had he just thrown a couple more punches, I think Mir was done. But, you know, in his back of his mind, the go to is submissions. And so, I mean, even if Nogueira's rocked from his previous fights, we, we've seen, you know, you can't count him out. Until you know he's out cold, and you know if he falls on his back and Herman tries to, to leap on him and go for the finish, I think Nogueira is just as dangerous there to grab something and slap on a submission. So, you know, is it's going to be a good fight. It'll be a good. You know, you never know what kind of Nogueira is going to show up, what kind of injuries he's going through, and how he's if he's fully healthy. Had that that uh, uh, really uh, what's the 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 wrestling injury, jujitsu injury, what staff? I couldn't think of it. Had a really bad staff infection, almost, you know, was life threatening for a little while. Um, had that during his first fight with Frank Mir, was actually in the hospital for a week leading up to that fight. But, but yeah, so I'm taking Nogueira to win this fight by submission. Um, it's going to be in Brazil. You know, Nogueira is all about that pride, that Brazilian pride, and he's going to have the whole country behind him. And uh, he's going to come in, he's going to look to finish this fight. And I could see these guys standing and trading for a while, but I think it's just a matter of time before, you know, somehow the fight ends up on the ground. And, uh, and you know, Nogueira, if he does get a hold of Herman, I don't think he'd be afraid to, to drop into guard and, and try that too. Or, you know, just try to slap on a standing guillotine or something like that. So uh, it should be an exciting fight. You know, Nogueira always brings it. Herman's a brawler. And I'm looking forward to this one. It's going to be a fun fight, but I'm taking Nogueira to win by, I'll say, second-round submission. Yeah, I think uh, I pretty much agreed with your sentiments. I think Nogueira is also, he doesn't get enough credit for being one of the smartest fighters in the game. If you look at a lot of his fights, especially his pride fights, um, he's one of the fighters who kind of is best at following through with the game plan. And it always seems like because of his crafty submissions, um, he always has a secondary game plan, like against Frank Mir. I, I know the refs called the back of the head shot a couple times. And so instead of... I don't, for whatever reason, I guess he didn't want to get into a better position to hit Frank. Like you said, he 
could have, if not knocked him out, at least hit him enough times when Frank was, you know, stunned and didn't have any wits. You know, lights are on, but nobody was home, so the ref would have stopped it. He chose to go with a guillotine, which shows that, like, you know, he basically has his bread and butter as his submissions, and that's what he's always going to seek, you know, on the spot. That's his first instincts right there. Just if something changes, something gets complicated, something pops up that was unexpected. He's going to go for his jiu-jitsu. He's going to go for his submissions. Um, and most of the time, they work. Um, you know, Noguera is a true legend, um, definitely future Hall of Fame contender without question. Um, Dave Herbin is one of the most frustrating fighters. Um, I think he has all the potential in the world to be right up there in discussion with, like, you know, the Stefan Struves or the Travis Browns, uh, you know, the up-and-comers of the heavyweight division. Um, but the problem is he still doesn't train MMA full-time. He doesn't train it at, you know, he doesn't go to a major MMA gym to do it for the most part, and he doesn't train it full time. So he's until he does that, I just don't have the faith to choose him in these big fights and these big situations. I, I went against my gut, and I think I did it against Stefan Struve, um, but Struve just basically showed the difference between, you know, what a full time MMA fighter and a part time MMA fighter really is. Um, and I think Herman could have won that fight. You know, he. He does some unconventional things, and he, he's not afraid to take risks. He's also one of their most athletic heavyweights. He has a solid chin. He hits hard himself. You know, he doesn't get nervous under pressure at all. I um, mean, he won his first something like 16 fights before he even started training MMA, like legitimate MMA. He was just kind of here and there training and mostly doing athletics and going to the gym. It's pretty impressive. Um, but, you know, he, you can only coast on talent for so far. That's why BJ Penn has a great legacy, but he isn't one of the elite elite necessarily. Um, and he does have a lot of losses in fights that he should have won. Um, I do think that if Herman loses this fight, it would be stupid of the UFC to cut him. And I only say that because the heavyweight division's in a place where, yeah, it's a lot better than it used to be, but it's still fringing on being potentially shallow if you cut some contenders like that. Also, Herman's fought some of the top guys, too, a possible future title, title contender in Struve. You know, he fought Roy Nelson, um, and he's fighting Noguera. So it's kind of a tough, those are <laughs> really tough three opponents to get in your tour of duty with the UFC. I hope UFC kind of recognizes that, and I doubt Herman comes with a high price tag either. So hopefully they are smart and not dumb about it and keep him around if he loses. And I think it's fairly likely that he's going to lose. Um, if you train MMA full-time, I think I honestly would be picking Dave Herman. Um, just the same as a prime Noguera I would pick all day long. But in this situation, especially in Brazil, I think Noguera is going to pull it out. It might be kind of a gritty fight, and it might take Herman gassing and possibly you know winning the first round and Noguera having to survive that. But I think Noguera is eventually going to catch him in a submission. I'm going to say it's going to be a guillotine choke in the second round. All righty, and moving on to the main event. <clears throat> One that's pretty much saving the card. Anderson Silva said he was out until 2013, most likely, but he's stepping up to save the card, probably making some serious money. Uh, moving up to the light heavyweight division to take on Stefan Bonner. Uh, we got quite the uh, the rocky story in the making. That's pretty much what this fight's being advertised as. Um, it is really just a, a fun fight. Really, for either fighter, win or lose, I don't really think it's... I mean, Bonner, for a win, it would do huge things for his career if he decided to just stay in the game and, and not retire on a, a win. But other than that, you know, win or lose for Silva. Should he lose, I really don't think it's going to hurt him as much as some people may think. Uh, you know, he's still the middleweight champion, and uh, he's still got the, uh, the undefeated title defense streak and, you know... Give or take how he loses, I really I don't see him getting knocked out by Stefan Bonner. Bonner doesn't have uh, really the power in his his hands, but you know I'm I'm excited for this fight. A lot of people are thinking it's going to be a uh, repeat of the Anderson Silva Forrest Griffin fight, where Silva's just going to come out and make Bonner look silly. Definitely has the ability to do so. Could happen, but Bonner has always been a brawler, a fighter. He brings it, win or lose. The dude's in a fight. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen, you know, Bonner not bring it. Uh, you know, he he doesn't, I don't believe, have any losses in the UFC. Yeah, he has not been finished in the UFC. 
Um, all, all of his losses have come by way of decision. And, uh, you know, all his fights have been brawls. And, you know, a lot of people forget, you know, this is a guy that's been in the cage with John Jones and has gone three rounds with John Jones. And uh, he definitely was on, a, you know, the other side of a, a lopsided de- decision. Jones definitely controlled that fight. But, you know, he's been in there with some of the best in the uh, in the UFC. John Jones, uh, he has a loss to, to Mark Coleman. That's kind of sad. But, uh, but, but, yeah, you know, he's got his classic fight with... The hammer. Yeah, with, you know, Forrest Griffin. A couple fights with Forrest Griffin. He's been in there with uh, Rashad Evans, Jardine. And, uh, you know, before he... Was in the UFC in the Ultimate Fighter. He has a fight, a loss to Lyoto Machida. But you know, this is the he's been wanting a big fight. He's been trying to call out Rampage for a while, and uh, you know, he was kind of in limbo on whether he was retired or not. He's on a three-fight win streak, so this is a huge fight for him in the division. And believe me, he's going to come out. He's going to bring it, and I, I think this is going to be quite an interesting fight. You know, uh, he does have wrestling background or a, a wrestling ability. Uh, he's taken fights to the ground, and, uh, you know, Anderson Silva doesn't have the greatest takedown defense. Uh, did have a nice takedown stop against Chill Sonnen in their, their last fight that really ultimately led to his, his victory in knocking uh, TKOing Sonnen. But um, Anderson Silva definitely can be taken down, and, you know, by, uh, you know, if, Guys with, you know, not you don't have to have Chell Sonnen caliber wrestling to take down Anderson Silva is what I'm getting at. So, um, but I, I, I don't really think I can see Bonner getting a hold of Silva in this fight. I think Silva's going to be pretty evasive and uh, pick his shots. But, you know, I would not be surprised if there's another fight that goes to uh, decision. And uh, I, I think Bonner's going to surprise a lot of people. He's really got nothing to lose. And... Uh, He's going to bring it to Silva. He's one of those guys that, you know, you could be Anderson Silva, John Jones. He's not going to give you any respect. He's going to bring you a fight. And, uh, you know, that's what people like about Bonner. And, you know, it's hard to – I mean, I think he's the, the, the biggest main event underdog in the history of the UFC, somewhere around 14-1 to 1 odds. So it's hard to really pick Bonner to win this fight. I'm picking um, – I would, I, or I should say, I will, I'm citing on the fact that this is going to actually be a decent fight, and it's going to be exciting, and it's going to surprise people, and it's going to be worth tuning in and seeing. Um, but I'm picking Anderson Silva to win this one, and uh, I'll say he wins by TKO. Um, I'll say he catches Bonner for the first time in his career in the in the third round, uh, towards the end of the fight. But I, I'm expecting Bonner to bring it to him. Um, I also kind of have a questions as to how motivated Silva is for this fight. And uh, we've kind of seen Silva in his past against, you know, matchups with Damian Maya, um, uh, Talos Leites, did he fight yeah, Leites, um, and also, uh, what was his other fight, title fight, um, Patrick Cote. They're all kind of weird you know, he didn't really approach the fight in typical Anderson Silva fashion. So, but it seems like he's kind of been over that, and uh, he's he's been bringing it in most of his fights. But you know, you never know. We'll kind of see how motivated he is for this fight. But I expect him to to bring it to Bonner. I, I'm looking forward to this fight. And like Dana White said, it is really just a fun fight. And you know, it could quite possibly be the biggest UFC upset of all time. So if uh, Bonner pulls it out but you know i'm, g- I'm going to take anderson silva it's hard to, to to bet against him in this or pick against him with those kind of odds but um, i'm expecting a good fight so but i'm taking anderson silva tko in the third round yeah the more i look at this fight um i totally agree with dana white sentiments and that being that it's one of those fights it's just a fun fight you know it's one of those fights where the fan wins i mean it doesn't have to be not every fight has to be for a future contender necessarily. You know, it's kind of like how, you know, the same treatment with Legends. I mean, both these guys are not over the hill by any means, especially Anderson Silva. But 
you know, just because somebody can't earn a title shot anymore doesn't mean they should stop fighting. You know, they should stop fighting when their body's not physically able because, number one, these guys need money. Number two, these guys want to carve out a legacy, and some of these guys just want to be the, you know, they realize they're not going to get a title shot, and they just want to be the Chris Lattles of the world, and they want to win those just fight of the night bonuses. They want to have memorable moments for the fans. That's what defines them. That's what defines Stefan Bonner. He's a fighter for the fans, if there ever was one. He goes out there. He lays it all on the line. He's at his ups. He's at his downs, and he makes no excuses about that. Um, he's probably the first one to admit his own faults. Um, you know, I think he's just going to go in there like he says, and you know, his qu- direct quote is, I'm just going to go in there and give him hell. And I think that's exactly what he's going to do. I think he's going to go in there and make it a dogfight, and he's not going to. He's going to go down on his shield. We'll put it that way. Um, I do think, though, I don't think he's going to be able to use his wrestling on Anderson Silva. Um, I know Bonner has an underrated ground game, but you know, he's not the guy who's going to shoot for a double. I mean, I could see him possibly tripping Anderson in the clinch if they're against the fence, because Bonner will be the bigger, stronger guy. So that could be interesting if they tie up. He will be the one who has a size advantage. Um, but I definitely, you know, if Chael Sonnen double can't get Anderson down 100% of the time, I really don't think Bonner has really much luck of that unless it's, like I said, a trip takedown like against the fence or something like that. But in order to do that, you have to pin Anderson Silva there. Way easier said than done. Um, I unfortunately do think this fight's going to look similar to Forrest Griffin versus Anderson Silva. I don't think it's going to be that much of a kind of embarrassing where Forrest gets knocked out by like a grazing jab. Um, I think it, it'll it be kind of more resembling the Chael Sonnen knockout where it wasn't a full knockout. It was kind of just a lot of shots in a short amount of time and he can't defend himself early, or, excuse me, fast enough. Um, but I do see Bonner taking a surprising amount of shots and people being a little bit shocked about that. So I see Anderson Silva finishing Stefan Bonner late in the first round. Uh, but that's how I see it going. I got to go with my heart on this one. I'm going to pick Bonner just because. Just because. Wow, man. You better throw down some money if you're uh, if you're picking up too. Man, you throw down 10 bucks, you're going to make some bank. Wow. Yeah, I think I might. I think I might just because, I, I mean, I got to – for some reason, I just I, I don't pick on gut feelings, and I fully acknowledge that I'm picking the wrong guy. I'm saying this now. I'm picking the wrong guy. I just I, – I think that the cards are going to align, and – It's only three I, rounds, too, so it's not five. It's a main event, but it's three rounds, and, you know, I mean, it, yeah, Bonner had a, a losing streak for a little while, but he's a tough guy. If you're in a decision kind of fight with him, you're going three rounds. You know, he's – if you can get – his shots on you, he's he he'll land his points. And you know, Anderson Silva is definitely more the, you know, the the pick his shots and go for a finish kind of fighter. But should this go three rounds, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Bonner could also pull off a decision win. Well, here's the thing. I think Anderson. Part of what's making me want to pick this fight, the logical side of me, not just the Rocky believer side of me, um, is that Anderson's taking this fight on short notice, and we have seen Anderson look a little bit tired later in fights like the Damian Maya fight ones where he kind of clowned I think just to kind of show hide excuse me hide the fact that he was tired um what I see Bonner doing actually is having a good enough chin to close the distance and get a hold of him and I see the problem he presents even though he's kind of just some goofy awkward big white boy is that he's a lot bigger than Anderson Silva he is the biggest if you look at it guy that Anderson's ever faced James Irvin's pretty close at 6'2 a huge light heavyweight but his type of style doesn't really rely on his size other than just for punching power which as we've seen with Anderson punching power really doesn't matter he's gonna see inside your strikes counter punch the shit out of you and you're going down Bonner I see him kind of wading through a bit of punches and getting his clutches on Silva putting him up against the fence and kind of holding him there. I actually don't think it's going to be that great of a fight. I'm going to just go um, Stefan Bonner decision. Well, Bonner's saying that he, he kind of feels like his old man strength is kicking in too, so he's kind of got that on his side. But, uh, but yeah, the, so those are our UFC 153 predictions. Uh, I think there's going to be some good matchups. Uh, yeah, the card fell apart a little bit, but, you know, we, there's some good fights. I mean, we've been talking for, you know, 45 minutes now on these uh, these fights, and... Uh, I'm looking forward to them. So what we're going to do now is we're uh, – I'm going to try dividing these up in segments. I was hoping these this was going to be a little bit shorter, but 45 minutes – I mean, we did talk about six fights. But 
Um, if you look above, we got a link to uh, our second segment. Um, so this closes out our, our predictions bit. And uh, so feel free to, to tune in. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, UFC on FX, give our recap uh, of the fights this past week, and then also just touch on um, Mayhem Miller and his uh, his recent actions on the, the MMA hour with Ariel Hawani, kind of out of character or in character, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so feel free to, to tune in for our, our next segment. But if you guys are, are bouncing, enjoy the fights. Coop, any, any last words for first segment? Uh, don't bother arguing with me on my main event pick. I'm not going to defend myself. There you have it. All right. Segment one over. Uh, click above. You can keep on listening. Peace.